Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start the lecture now. And uh, today I'm going to cover electrical safety. I'll go through the basics, then talk about safety about diathermy. Good Safe. afternoon, everyone, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start the lecture now. Sorry about that. <clears throat> We're just going to go back again. So we'll be talking about electrical safety today. And our first part of the lecture is about electrical safety, the basics. Then we'll talk about electrical safety with diathermy and also about pacemakers. So first part is about basics. Now you would have seen birds perched on the electrical wires. They don't get roasted. And if you understand why, then you have understood quite a bit about electricity. I'll come back to this uh, later on. So we'll continue with the lecture. So how do we define electrical safety? Electrical safety is defined as containment or limitation of hazards, which include the electrical shock, fires, explosions, and damage to equipment and building. Today we're going to mainly concentrate on electrical shock. We could talk about a bit about fires uh, when we talk uh, about safety in diathermy, but we're not going to talk about explosions and damage to equivalent buildings. Now, why is understanding electrical safety very important for us? As staff, we are in contact with electrical equipment. This equipment are plugged into electrical sockets. And then we connect the equipment, especially the monitoring or therapeutic ones to the patient. And we are in contact, not only with the equipment, but also with the patients who is then connected to equipment, which could be monitoring or therapeutic. Now being in contact with electrical supply exposes us to macro shock. Whereas the patient is exposed to macro shock because they're directly connected to the equipment and also micro shock, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. So what exactly is macroshock and what is microshock? So macroshock is large amount of current flowing through our body that can cause harm or death. Whereas microshock is more in relation to patients, this is very small amount of current causing shock that is VF and even death. And this only happens in electrically susceptible patients, patients who have direct, have conduit, external conduit, which are in direct contact with the heart, like for example, pacing wires or saline filled catheters like CVP line, artery line, or pulmonary artery of rotation catheter. We don't use much, but they're still used in some certain situations. So large amount of current can flow through a patient or through us, only if we directly touch a 4D equipment. Whereas with microshock, like I said, you need to have a current of almost 150 to 100 microamps. Usually more than five, it has to be more than 50 microamps and at least 100 microamps to cause uh, VF. So we'll look at microshock, how does it actually happen? It's no rocket science. If you have a faulty equipment, you say, for example, you have faulty toaster, you touch it, and you feel tingling sensation, and you or you feel like current flowing through you, that's a macro shock. It may not have killed you, you felt it. That's macro shock. 
Okay. So let's uh, look at the how electrical equipment are powered. So you have a socket and we have the live neutral and earth in there. You plug in the socket and switch it on and the equipment works. The current starts flowing from the live, and goes, come back to the neutral, does the work, back to the earth. Okay. Now where the sockets are connected, there is earth and this earth is basically wire which is dug deep into the earth. Now let's see if there is a fault in the equipment and there's some leakage of current for whatever reasons, because the insulation has come off or there's a loose connection. And if you now touch this body, which is now called a hot body, because it has current flowing into the casing, if you touch it, the current will flow through us and then return back via the earth and completing the circuit. And we could actually get a shock. But obviously the effect will depend on Ohm's law, what is the frequency and how much current is flowing through us. Now the current which is supplied domestically or even to the hospitals is actually a transmitter at 50 Hertz. Now this is considered as a dangerous frequency because this is a frequency that can synchronize with the heart and actually cause uh, problems called VF again. Okay. Now, if you have around one plus milliamp passing through us, nothing happens. It just may cause tingling sensation. But if it is more than 15 plus milliamps at 240 volts, this is called cannot let go current. And this can cause pain and asphyxia, which occurs at a current of more than 50 milliamps and can cause slow death. Again, to paralyze your diaphragm. Then at 50 to 100 plus milliamps, that can cause rapid death by ventricular fibrillation. Okay. So what amount of current flows through you, that determines what you'll feel. You may not feel anything at all, or you have you know, a tingling sensation, or even can lead to death. Okay. So what happens if, 240 volts or 230 volts at 50 hertz passes through for one second. Like say one milliamp and above we call tingling sensation. Five milliamps can cause pain. 50 milliamps leads to severe pain with local muscle spasm. 50 milliamps can cause respiratory muscle spasm. So slow death asphyxia. Whereas 80 to 100 milliamps will lead to dysrhythmias with pump failure. Now, why have I highlighted the 50 milliamps? This is what is let go current. What happens is your flexors are stronger than your extensors. And when current flows through your flexors, the hand will actually go into spasm, the flexor muscles, and you won't be able to let go of the current. Now, that's not the only thing. Normally, you have automatic intentional reflexes, which will try to throw you off. You would like to actually move away from it. But when the current flows through you, your sympathetic system is activated. When your sympathetic system is activated, you start sweating. And sweat has got a lot of sodium chloride, which increases conductivity within the body. And now that's not good because you already have your flexors which are going to spasm and then you're allowing more current to flow through you. So that becomes dangerous. So where dry skin has got very high resistance, but if you have sweaty hands, uh, that reduces your resistance to a you know, flow of current through the body drastically. No, so that's a protection for us that we would reflexly try to move away from this danger. But why are patient risk? This is very obvious. So one thing is that just like I explained to you before, we are intentionally connecting patient uh, to electrical 
systems, that is, you know, monitors, diathermy, diagnostic equipment. And then you have patients who are anesthetized, so they can't actually move. Or even if they are not anesthetized, for example, in intensive care, they might be at least sick, too sick to actually move or, you know, use their normal natural reflexes. And in theaters, the surgeons tend to, you know, prep the skin with liquid, which would reduce the resistance of the skin. So they become more susceptible. So how do we prevent these electrical hazards? So you have to remember that hazards can be minimized, but we can't eliminate them. They do exist. So how are new your equipment is, there's always some leakage current, which can cause harm to you. So first thing what we look at is the electrical supply. We said that this is important, and hence it is important that there is regular maintenance, and we use something called isolated power. This is used in the theaters and in intensive care or critical care areas. We don't have isolated power systems at home. This is for the hospitals. And if you look at the equipment, um, there is, you can, you need earth. I will come to that. How earth can be useful as well. It's a double-edged sword. We use something called isolated circuits and appropriate equipment, which are defined by the electrical safety symbols, which again, I will discuss when we talk about safety in theaters. What about precautions against microshock? So if you look at microshock, only patient, not us, the patient are susceptible to microshock, especially those who have something like pacing wires or CVP lines, RT lines, through which current can flow directly to the heart. So obviously, electrical supply, again, we need to make sure there's regular maintenance, we use isolated power. But when we look at the, uh, the equipment, then it says that if you want to prevent microshock, there should be no earth. The equipment should not be earth when we are using. And we need to use isolated circuits. It, we need to use appropriate equipment, which are again defined by the electrical safety symbols. Again, we'll come to that. And um, these are very, very important. Uh, for uh, the FRC as well as SADC. So I keep talking about isolated power supply. What exactly is isolated power supply? What is isolation transfer? What is a safe patient power? Now this is uh, in one of our intensive cares and uh, you can actually read on it. It says isolated power system. Okay. And if you look closely at the blue sockets, okay, it says IPS, socket number nine by five. So that's, IPS stands for the isolated power supply. And if you, actually it's not very well visible, it says equipment only, okay. So theater equipments only. So what is isolation? What are we isolating? And why are we isolating things? Now, if we look at the uh, power supply from the power stations, uh, they all are supplied in three phases. So there are three coils. So you have three phase primary winding. If you see in the center of the, uh, your, I love it. So, yeah, yeah, okay. So they see that three phase uh, power winding. That, that that is what is part of the turbine. Uh, that is what is powered by steam uh, or water in hydroelectric. And then move. And as it moves, it induces current into these coils, which are outside at 240 volts. And each of these 240 volts, if you look at one part is called the life, and whereas the neutral part they are connect together to the earth, their earth. So this is what happens at the substations. So you got power from substation and uh, this is what is the supply. 
so you have the live wire coming in in one of those. Um, then you have the neutral and you have the earth, which you, you plug in. And again, the neutral is earth. And we have the earth, which is again there. And because earth is a good conductor as such, so all they need to do is put a, a conducting wire or a plate or you know a thing rod into, into the ground and that acts as a, a your earth connection. So if you were to really touch a live wire and you are standing on a non-conductive platform, then you're not able to complete a circuit. So this understanding what a circuit, complete circuit is, that's very, very important for understanding electrical safety. But what if this is a person who is in a, uh, you know, a urology theater, the, there's water on the uh, floor and person is standing what happens in this case? In this case, what will happen is the current will flow through the body and then to the earth and it'll complete a circuit and the person can get a shock. This is what a micro shock is. Okay. So here the written path is completed and patient gets shock. So what exactly is the isolation transformer? The so isolation transformers, what do you have? You got two circuits. So there's a primary circuit in which the uh, neutral and earth are connected together, but we use the isolation transformer where magnetic field, alternating magnetic field is used. So you can only have isolation transformer with AC current, not with direct current, you can't form a yeah, isolation transformer. So since the current is going in positive and negative, okay, the magnetic field keeps changing, that induces current in the secondary coil. And then you have similar kind of the number of turns are the same you have the current flowing through line one. So we no longer have live wire in neutral. They are just called line one and line two, and there's no earth. So that's what an isolation transformer does. You can connect the equipment here, yeah, the bulb will blow. Okay. There's no earth, so we freed it from there. So we can forget the primary circuit. So we have a circuit, the secondary circuit, where we have line one and line two, there's no earth at all. Okay. Now let's consider the same thing. The patient is still standing on the earth, it touches line one, but no current flows through it because the circuit cannot be completed through the earth here. Since line two is not connected to the earth, it can't be completed. So unless there is also earthing of the line two, you cannot complete a circuit. Or you have to be stupid enough to actually hold both line A and line B or line one and line two to complete a circuit for that. That you're not going to do, isn't it? Not be the stupid. Okay. So, like I said, if by mistake or whatever reason, the line B is also earth accidentally, or somebody tried to act very clever and they do that, in that case, yes, you actually, this is no longer isolated. For a supply to be isolated, it needs to be isolated from the earth. That's the definition of isolation. Okay. So for isolation system to be safe, it should be earth free. And this is also not a floating circuit where there is no earth, then you have a floating circuit. So that's the definition of a floating circuit. So floating circuit requires two things. One thing is that a floating circuit uses isolation transformer. And second, the patient circuit is always earth free. Now you cannot float if you're on the earth, isn't it? Well, you can't fly at least. Floating circuit is also used in diathermy, which again, I will likely discuss uh, later on. And this is again, a safety feature. Uh, again, they're using a floating circuit. There is no other thing and that what's to make. So it's a bit confusing. Is this earth, is it safe or is it unsafe? Or is it a safety feature or is it hazard? So there are different type of earths so that is the normal earth. That is uh, what you actually see. It. That is called a functional earth. If you see a symbol, which is a symbol of an earth, which is encircled, that's called a protective earth. And then you could actually see a circle within an inverted triangle. And this is known as equipotential earth. So there are different uh, types of earth. So functional earth is earth, which is in your socket. That is called functional earth. 
Protective earth is the earth is the wire connected to the body of your equipment. And that is called the protective earth. And I'll talk about equipotential earth in a minute. So if you see in the circle, in a blue circle, and uh, there, that's the uh, your functional earth. Uh, that's the equipotential earth. And here, there's an earth wire connected to the body of the machine, and that is the protective earth. So this is a protective earth, functional earth, and equipotential earth. Just labeling them. Okay. I explained to you how no earth can lead to macro shock. So if there is a leakage of current, bodies become hot, you touch it, you will get a shock. Depending, depending on how much uh, amount of current is leaking through it. Okay. But if the body is earth, so this is the earth connected to the body of the equipment, and uh, this is called protective earth. And it is a path of least resistance. So when there is a leakage of current, most of the current will pass to the earth. And if you touch it, very small current passes through you. So it might be even less than five milliamps or one milliamp. You may feel tingling sensation, not feel at all. So the protective earth is important for us. and It protects us. So all the equipment or you know, gadgets at home, they all have protective earth because macro shock should not occur at home. But when this earth becomes disconnected and there is a leakage of a current for, because of wear and tear, because of, you know, wires becoming loose, coming off, then that causes dangers. So earth is protecting us. The protective earth is important for preventing uh, macro shock. Okay. So does earth become a danger? Yes, it does. And that's why uh, it is not used in the supply, uh, which is there in the hospital, in the operation theaters. So you have a patient who is connected to ECG. Uh, he's on the uh, table. The table are made of metal and they have contact. And by any chance, if there is flow of current, through the body, then what can happen is that you can, you know, if there's, there's no problem, but if the equipment that is connected to the patient is now, you know, earth. So for example, you have ECG machine, uh, even though it has got isolated power, but if it is sitting on a trolley that is earth and the earth can fall and then you can actually get shock. Patient can get shock, it can get burns. Okay. And one of the important thing is wherever there is a difference in potential, there will be a flow of current. Okay. So that will flow and they will like that. And this is very, very important. But if you actually have three jars and with different levels, and if you connect them together, they will all come to the earth again. And that's where this is important. So you got a patient who is connected to multiple earths. Each of them is going to leak current at different amounts. And depending on uh, which is the higher potential, it will flow from high potential to lower potential. So multiple earths are dangerous. And if this current flows through, even if it's a very small amount, it's around 100 microamps, not even milliamps, 100 microamps, uh, it can cause uh, VF and shock, so the micro shock. So multiple Earths in a patient who's in theater is dangerous. Okay. So multiple Earths on a patient is unsafe. It increases the risk of micro shock. So how do we make patients safe from micro shock? Okay. Now we do use uh, equipment which has got isolated power, but if for any chance we detect that there is uh, you know, multiple hours and it's impossible to actually keep the patient earth free in that, that's where the equipotential earth points come in. So you see this equipotential earth points everywhere and, and there. You know, theaters should have them, machines actually have on the back of them. So if you have multiple earth, what you need to do is you need to actually take all the earths and using a, a wire that's a special wire with a low uh, resistance wires, and these are connected 
together. And when we're done, then everything comes to the same potential, exactly uh, like uh, a bird sitting on a wire. Okay. So if you have different potential, they will flow at a different rate. If you connect them together, okay, they will all come to the same potential. That's what equipotentiality is. Now, this is a pendant, and you can actually see those equipotential points. Uh, this is the one where the machine and the equipotential points will be connected. So this is equipotential Y. You can see that it's connected on the machine at the point, so that the, that's the equipotential wire. And uh, you can see the equipotential points here. That's the equipotential point that's connected. And the other bit goes on to the pendant, the equipotential point on the pendant. So that's how this is there. So that was um, basics of electricity or basics of the electrical safety. Now let's come to a further into the electrical safety in theaters. And here I'm going to discuss about diathermy as well. So that's uh, one of our theaters. Uh, this is a hybrid theater. And you see there is lots of equipment around. Now let's see some of the equipment. We talk about this, okay? So if you look at it, that's the power source. That's the earth. That's the functional earth. And you see these points. Uh, you see a point uh, on the right side, that one. And you see this symbol, which is the earth. Uh, in a circle, that is your protective earth. And there's another point, which is like a peg. And this is a circle inside an inverted triangle. And that's a equipotential point. So these are all there on the machines. Okay. These are some of the bricks, we call them. Uh, these are attached to the back of the machines. Uh, so your temperature monitoring, pressure, ECG, CO2. Okay. Let's see this one. So here there is a symbol of heart inside a box and the two paddles around. And the same thing here. Okay, there's ECG respiration, SPO2, and IBP monitor, temperature monitor. Okay. Now let's look at this machine. Okay, here we have, you know, that's a man inside a box with uh, two paddles on either side. This is a Massimo a rainbow system. This is a TVA pump, okay. So that's, it says that, that, and then what about this here? There are two symbols, one's a box in a box, and then you have a, a heart inside a box and that exactly like what we had on the brick. Uh, this is a bear hugger, and you see a man inside a box again. This is our gas uh, monitor, okay. And you have man inside a box. That's our nurse stimulator. Okay. This one actually tells you what exactly it is. So it says type BF. So it's, it's a man inside a box and this is type BF working at nine volt. Maximum of 60 milliamps. Yeah, this is a Litco cardiac output monitor. Okay, here you have, this is one which is attached to the heart directly. So throughout your line, and here you have a heart inside a box and two paddles on the either side. This is from a MacWit table, and this has got two things. So it's got a box in a box and IPX X4. Okay, that's another new one. And this is a fluid warmer, a different type of fluid warmer. I can see that there's a, it's got a man, only, not inside a box, and it's got droplet. And this is a diathermy machine uh, with a droplet, and there's again a, a heart inside a box, and uh, it's got two paddles around it. Okay. That's a bear hugger, another type of bear hugger. Okay. That I've already shown. Uh, this is our uh, top watch, and at the ba back it says IPX0. And we have a, a man inside a box. This is uh, our uh, portable CO2 monitor, the EMMA. 
And even this one actually has got a man inside a box uh, with two paddles. So any equipment uh, which is used in theaters, uh, especially which is connected to the patient, they classified into class, into type, uh, suitability for use in flammable atmosphere, which is not very common, but protection against ingress of water or IPX, that's important. So they can be classed into class one, two, and three, like B, B, F, and C, F, and then you have suitability of use in flammable agent. So AP is anesthetic proof, uh, APG is anesthetic proof for gases, and then we have IPX one, four, and seven. So what is class one equipment? Class one equipment is a basic equipment like anything, like the one we use at home. Okay, so this one has got an earth, a protective earth. That means the body of the equipment is earth and connected to the earth in the socket. Now class two is the only equipment which has got a symbol to it. And this is a box inside a box. So there is a basic insulation, and then there is another secondary insulation outside so that the current cannot flow to the body of the equipment. And class three equipment are the equipment which use something called SELV or safety electrical low voltage, which is maximum of 24 volts for AC current and 40 volts for DC current. And because they're using low voltage, you don't actually get a shock, even if there is a breakdown of uh, you know, the insulation or if there's breakdown of the wire coming off and touching that, even if you touch them, you will not get a shock. You might feel a tingling sensation, but you won't take it. The next classification is classification by type. And any diagnostic, therapeutic, life-supporting equipment used in intensive care or in the theaters must comply with this uh, classification. And this is type B, BF, or CF. And this classification is based on something called allowable leakage current. So unless you understand what is permissible leakage current or allowable leakage current, you cannot define this uh, equipment. So what exactly is leakage current? Now we've seen that the current flows through the live wire, does the work written back via the neutral. If there isn't any leakage of current, like if there is a loss of insulation, if there is a disconnection, the current will flow to the body. And if the body is earth, the current will likely come back and return back via the earth that is a protective earth, so that you're not shocked when you touch it. So leakage current is basically the current that does not return back via the neutral. And now we know that equipment in the theaters do not actually have earth wire connected to the body. They do not have protective earth. And that's why it is very, very important that this amount of leakage current is kept to the lowest. That is that which you do not even feel or that which is less than 50 microamps, especially in the equipment that is connected to the patient. So leakage current, Remember the definition leakage current is defined as any current that does not return back by the neutral is a leakage current. So we look at the how the equipment is classified based on the allowable leakage current or permissible leakage current. So if you see a symbol of a man, only a man, not inside a box, this is just a man or a body, B for body, you can remember that way. Now this, or can be applied to patient, but the maximum permissible leakage current allowable leakage current is below the threshold for skin sensation. That is less, it's less than 500 microamps. You need at least one milliamp for to feel the tingling sensation. Five milliamps will cause pain. 15 milliamps will cause muscle spasm, okay? So this is below the threshold for even sensation. And this is unlikely to cause any pain or injury. Now, examples of these kind of equipment are like thermometers, manometers, gas analyzers, ventilator alarms. Now, these can be type B. But what about BF? So if you see a man or a body inside a box, that is called type BF. Okay. So how is it different? Well, it 
use a type F, isolated circuit. F is a floating. So it, F stands for floating, so body floating. So, and this is suitable for application where surface electrodes are used. Okay. And for surface electrodes, we tend to apply jelly, yeah, which reduces the conductivity. That's important, especially when you are measuring uh, the biological sim, uh, signals, which are very, very small. If you cannot, if you don't actually have a conducting jelly, you're not, you will not be able to do that. So you are reducing the resistance of the body by applying them. And that's what makes it a little hard. But if you look at the maximum permissible leakage current, this is same as type BF. Okay. The difference is that type BF uses a floating circuit. That means there is no earth. So definition of a floating circuit is a circuit that uses an isolation transformer. And what is isolating from? From the earth, so it is earth free. So you need to have equipment which is user isolation transformer and it's earth free, that is type BF. An example of these are like your forced air warmers, blood warmers, nerve stimulators are type BF. There's no type C because anything which is attached to heart has to be uh, very, very safe. Okay, so this is the most stringent uh, protection against hazard. And this is intended for the equipment which is applied or have a direct intercardiac connection. So, or anything, even though like ECG does not actually have a direct connection, but still it is type CF. But anything like artery line, center line, your pulmonary artery, your rotation catheters, the pacing wires, these are, you know, all type CF. So maximum permissible leakage current in this case is one tenth of type B or BF. So it's only less than 50 microamps. And there will always be floating circuit in these cases. So you're looking at the ECG, EMG, EEG, pacemakers, devices, you know, anything, cardiac catheters of any, any kind are have to be type CF. Okay. Next comes uh, the classification, which is about the flammability. Okay. Zones of risks are you know, around the patient, the five centimeters around. And this is very, this is enriched with oxygen which obviously supports, uh, which is combustible. But also nitrous oxide, we don't use it as much now, but still if it is there, then it supports combustion, so nitrous oxide. So that's the enriched environment, uh, which is you know, within the five centimeters. But if you go beyond five centimeters, 25 centimeters, uh, the gases are gonna get diluted uh, with air. So that is the next one. So any equipment uh, which is, uh, you know, beyond 25 centimeters or within five to 25 centimeters can be anesthetic proof. But if it is within five centimeters, it need to be anesthetic proof. G, G stands for gases, okay. So anesthetic proof are suitable for use in flammable atmosphere. We don't have flammable atmospheres now in the operation theaters. We don't use ethers. Oh, we have new ethers, but they are not flammable not like the old ether, which are flammable or trialing. So AP can be used within a zone of risk of five to 25 centimeters. Okay. And devices must not be capable of igniting any mixture of explosive anesthetic agent with air in normal use. Okay. And it is also based on surface temperature. The surface temperature is restricted to less than 200 degrees Celsius. And there should be no static sparks. That is, they should not cause fire even with static spark. Okay. APG are a lot more stringent. In this case, uh, this equipment can be used in a zone of maximum zero to five where there is a oxygen enriched environment. So it is much higher risk of fire. And these devices should not be capable of igniting a mixture of explosives, uh, anesthetic agents with oxygen or nitrous oxide. And this should not happen even in normal condition or even if there is a fault and there's a leakage or a spark. Okay. And the allowable temperature for these are body temperature or temperature of the body of the equipment is no more than 90 degrees. So that's how it defines the APG. Now we have equipment, if you look at it, where do you, uh, you know, clamp your uh, pumps on the pole? 
And what do you have about that? You have a bag of saline, you have a bag of uh, hot mints, plasmalite, whatever. And it could be dripping into that, into the pumps, your infusion pumps or into your TIVA pumps. So equipment which is uh, can be exposed to water need to also have IPX classification. IPX stands for I is for ingress, PX is protection. So ingress of water, protection against ingress of water. So if you see a droplet, that means it is drip proof. Okay, IPX one. If you see two droplets on the box, it is splash proof or IPX four. But if you see a equipment which has got a droplet uh, with a triangle in then that is IPX7 or it's water tight. That means it can actually dunk into a bucket of water and bring it out, nothing will happen to it. So highly you know, protective against ingress of water. So this is another classification you need to know, okay. So that is about the equipment as such. So we're coming to one of the basic equipments uh, which is used by surgeons all the time and which is a risk for patients, okay. So we talk about diathermy. Now, diathermy works at a very high frequency, unlike the current, which is at home, which is at 50 hertz. This works at 300 kilohertz and 3 megahertz, up to 3 megahertz. And the current flow is huge. It is 200 to 400 milliamps and nearly 2 amps when used in urology. So if you were to have such current flow at 50 hertz, uh, this will cause microshock, cardiac arrest, and death. So why doesn't it actually cause? A shock. Why doesn't even though such a high, huge amount of current is flowing through the body, why is it not causing any harm to the patients? Well, it is causing harm. It can cause burns, and that's what the thermia and coagulation does. I'll come to that in a minute, and I have actually given that answer uh, previously, but I will actually tell that about that again. So, if you're using cutting. Uh, I say surgeons are using cutting, then it's uh, usually high frequency oscillation of sine wave pattern, whereas uh, coagulation tend to use a damped or pulse sine wave pattern. And I'll show you what the patterns are. So this graph uh, I had shown before and uh, in the another lecture, sorry. So if you look at, uh, that's, that's where the 50 Hertz frequency is. And this is a high frequency, goes in megahertz. So as the frequency increases, the heating effect increases. So 50 Hertz is used for transmission because it does not cause heating. It can flow through easily. It's a dangerous frequency, but it doesn't heat up. So if you were to transmit you know, the current at very high frequency, the wires will melt away. And that's why lower frequency current is used. But if you use a much lower frequency as well, so like microwave, you know, they again cause heating. So more sensible uh, frequency for transmission of electricity is 50 Hertz. And as you increase the heating effect increases. So it will pass through the body, the current will pass through the body, but it'll cause heating effect. Okay. That's what is used. So coming to the diathermy waveform, um, this is a continuous sine waveform. Uh, this is used for cutting. When you have a Damp sine waveform, intermittent damp sine waveform, this is used for coagulation. Okay. But if you combine that, so you have the sort of damped sine waveform, but it's continuous, it's not intermittent. And this is called blend. So it can do cutting and coagulation together. This is used in urologies and it's called a blend. So these are the different waveforms. Sometimes the examiner will give you a card with this and ask you to identify them. So if you look at uh, the uh, coagulation, coagulation can be at uh, low power and high power. And when coagulation is used at low power, it causes desiccation. Desiccation is basically slow drying of the tissues. Whereas if you use high power, it causes fulguration. And in fulguration, you can have the, uh, you know, the uh, diathermy probe away from the skin and the current will flow through, through it, it'll call sparking, okay, this is, also known as uh, spark coagulation or black coagulation. So you can keep the, you don't have to touch the skin. It'll cause uh, electric arc lead to uh, quick and sudden rise of temperature more than 200 degrees Celsius. And uh, tissue is superficially carbonized. And that's why it's called black coagulation as well. Okay. 
So what is a power setting? Okay, this is obviously again comes to Ohm's law. So when uh, you, the surgeon, you ask, uh, oh, what settings do you want a diathermy on? The surgeon say, hey, can I have it at 30, 30 or 30, 50? So what is this 30, 30 or 30, 50? So when you have low power, which is less than 30 watts, that's used in dermatology or laparoscopic surgeries, neurosurgery, oral tumors or surgery, some plastic surgery, vasectomy, that is low power. So again, less than 30. Medium power is between 30 to 100 watts for cutting and it's 30 to 70 watts for coagulation. And this is what we normally use in general. So when the surgeon is saying, can I have 30, 30, that's what it means. He's going medium power. He wants cutting at 30, coagulation at 30. Yeah. Use an ENT, laparotomy, orthopedic surgery, thoracic surgery, vascular surgery, use. But sometimes you have to use very high power and that's more than 100 watts for cutting and more than 70 watts for cutting, sorry, coagulation. And this is sometimes used in ablative cancer surgeries in mastectomies where they, they use 100 80 to 300 watts for cutting and 70 to 120 watts for coagulation. Thoracotomy, where you have to go between the ribs, okay, use heavy fulguration. Again, they use 70 to 120 watts. Uh, Transurethral resections, uh, cutting 100 to 170 watts, coagulation 70 to 120 watts. Okay, so very high power used. I don't have to explain to you about monopolar or bipolar. Okay, so if you have active electrode with indifferent electrode, uh, you need a plate uh, that is uh, monopolar uh, diathermy. The flow of current occurs from the tip uh, to the indifferent electrode or plate. Whereas in case of uh, the uh, the uh, bipolar, uh, the current is flowing between the two uh, tips of the electrode. And, uh, you don't need to have that. The current density is always at the tip of the electrode, and that's why you need a plate which is uh, large, uh, which is attached to a vascular or area, so which has got uh, good blood flow uh, to dissipate the energy. Right? So there's high density at the tip and low density of current at the plate level. So you can have uh, the current placed on the arm, uh, mostly on thigh or back or the buttocks. These are areas which has got high vascularity and they will dissipate the energy. Now that's, this is where all the confusion actually occurs. Okay, people talk about, oh, earth is, is dangerous or you know, what is the isolation capacitor and how are the new diathermies? So, these are basically uh, generations, very generation of uh, the diathermy. The first generation diathermy uh, were where the plate was connected directly to the earth. In the second generation, they were using isolation capacitors and I'll tell you how it was used. But modern day diathermy use isolated, these are isolated, I think they use isolated power system. The one which we had talked about, which is earth free. So the first generation diathermy plates, uh, so if we actually had a diathermy machine which just had a plate and electrical electrode and there was no other thing if the plate came off, okay, it won't work. But if it is partially touching, uh, then the density of you know, current will be the same as at the tip and you get diathermy burns. So diathermy burns were very common when we actually had earth plate. Okay. So that's how it works, current uh, flows through the plate. So what happens is the problem. So if there is partial attachment of the current, okay, they can actually get higher density current at that and it can cause burns or plate burns. Now, what if the patient was also connected uh, to a monotic equipment, which are earth? That in that case, the current can not only flow through the point of attachment, or if it is completely detached and uh, there is no warning system, the current can actually flow to the electrode system. And that's how the electrode burns used to occur. We don't see them now. Okay, So electrode burns are not there. But if you look at the uh, literature, you will find uh, you know, patients with uh, plate burns, patients with uh, the electrode burns. 
So these were common. The plate bonds, electrode bonds were common uh, when we had diatomy jet and earth. Okay, so the plate was earth. So people realized that earth was dangerous. So how can we actually prevent that? So next uh, uh, level of diatomy. So this is this is again micro shock is also also common when there is earth. So if you have a uh, equipment or monitoring system which is earth and there is a leakage of current, then it can complete the circuit through the earth plate. So it becomes actually a risk for micro shock as well. So not only burns but also risk of micro shock it increases in patient which there is a earth diatomy. So the second generation uh, diathermy machines use something called isolated capacitor. And uh, this was 0 0.01 microfarad. And uh, the reactants uh, was this called a very high resistance at the normal frequency. So at 50 to 60 Hertz, that's the normal uh, frequency at which the you know, electricity is, is provided. Uh, the resistance is very, very high. So you could prevent the macro shock but at diathermy frequency at megahertz, it's very low frequency. So current can actually flow through it. So you can actually complete the circuit uh, through that. So what we did here in this case, okay, they said, okay, well, earth is okay, bad, uh, but what we can do is we can add an isolation capacitor uh, to the system. So when you're using a diathermy, uh, because it's a high frequency current, it will flow through it, it will complete the circuit and it'll flow. But what if there was a patient was connected to intracardiac catheters or ECG uh, with the earth monitor. In that case, okay, fine. The current cannot flow through this. And that's good. You prevented the micro shock. Okay. But what about if there is a disconnection? The current could still flow through the electrodes. Okay, complete a circuit through the earth thing and cause uh, uh, electrode burns. So it dis did not prevent electrode burns in, in this patient. So it prevented the burns from the diathermy. It prevented microshock, but it did not prevent the electrode burns. Then came the modern diathermy, which is solid state diathermy, which use a floating uh, circuit or isolated uh, you know, circuit. So just like I explained uh, for how the you know, isolation power system is, same thing is used here. So you have a primary circuit and you have a circuit, secondary circuit. And this is no longer live or neutral. This is just line one and line two. And that's completed through this circuit. If there is a disconnection, it won't work at all. Okay, the circuit won't be completed. Okay. But again, if this was a single plate and uh, you had not got a complete contact, you could still get that when we burn. So, we moved on to the next step. So this is not a next generation for the same generation, this thing. Okay, it is, that thing is called REM monitoring. Okay. So these new plates uh, had two electrode system. Okay. So the uh, active electrode was same, but the indifferent electrode had two plates. And for whatever reason, if there was any disconnection at any point, it would detect it and it give you a audio and visual alarm. Okay, so this is the written electric current monitor. Okay, so it monitors, so you have see that, this is a new diathermy machine. And if you look at it closely, and uh, there are two points in the REM system. And this works only with pads, which has got two in a slit. This is a slit pad. So you will see that this is not a single part. It's a, it's got a slit. It's got two parts, two conductive parts to it, and that's what it makes it uh, safer. Thank you. So if there is any disconnection or there is increased resistance or increased impedance, it will detect it. So it detects the contact between the two plates. So until there is a circuit completed within two plates, it's not going to work. One of the other, other worries about diathermy is pacemakers. Okay, what can it do? So you want to avoid any pacemaker interference. So you have the pacemaker unit, which are you know, just below the clavicle 
implanted and there's wires going in. So it's very important what kind of diathermy you're using, what is the strength and the proximity of the discharge uh, from the diathermy machine, or it's called, also called electrosurgical unit, okay, and types of uh, pacing electrodes. So what can actually go wrong? So first thing is that if the current flow is through the heart uh, where the wires are there, you can uh, have heating effect, you can have damage to the sensing, uh, you know, electrode, and that could cause. The second thing is that radio frequency interference. So diathermy machine work as very high frequencies. This produces radio frequency waves, and these can cause radio frequency interference. They can call capacitive uh, coupling. And again, they can cause interference in the monitoring. And you see it all the time. Whenever the surgeons see the diathermy, your ECG go haywire. Uh, sometimes in the pulse oximeter go haywire. And that's because of radio frequency interference. It's got nothing to do with uh, the leakage of current through the wires or anything. Like that. And it can again call capacitive couple, coupling. So you have uh, two uh, electrodes that they, which are conducting electrodes separated by air. Again, that can cause uh, capacitive coupling and that can cause interference. So interference can happen. Uh, they can be resetting of the uh, pacemaker unit. Uh, that'll be discussed more in details in the pacemaker uh, when I discuss about that. So um, best thing to use is, is a bipolar diathermy when you have pacemakers. Okay. The current path should not traverse the unit anywhere uh, between the pacing unit, which is below the uh, clavicle implant there and the wires. So there should be no current flowing in that direction. And you need to keep that diathermy pad as far as possible from the pacemaker unit in the heart. And even the diathermy unit should be kept as far away from the patient as possible, especially uh, if the pacemaker unit on the left side uh, move the diathermy plate to the right side near the uh, foot end. So keep it as far as possible uh, from the patient. So that will reduce the diathermy. Okay. And if anything goes wrong, be prepared to reset to asynchronous mode. So that requires uh, having a magnet over the uh, pacemaker that is changed to asynchronous mode. Uh, you take it off and it goes reset back to its normal. And if you're having a patient, uh, you have somebody who's got an ICD, you would need to consult the cardiologist or electrophysiological lab to find out uh, how or when they can come and uh, you know, disarm the unit and uh, reset it again after this. After the surgery is over, uh, there there are some changes which I will discuss in the pacemaker uh, lecture about uh, you know uh, how pacemakers safety uh, need to be considered differently. Thank you. You should also have uh, more for pacing the patient externally. So external pacer or transvenous spaces, whatever you have, use it. You can also use a pharmacological method like using isoprenaline at white micro ml, microgram per ml. Dilution boluses can be used. So you should always, whenever you have a patient with pacemaker and surgeon is going to use diathermy, be prepared as well. Thank okay. you. So in summary, avoid as far as possible diathermy in that is patient with pacemakers. And if you need to use, use bipolar, but if using monopolar, you need to have the plate or the indifferent electrode placed as far as possible from the pacemaker unit and do not apply current across the chest. And the strength and duration of the use should be minimal, it should be used in very short bursts. So don't use cutting, uh, coagulation uh, might be okay. Now, diathermy is also used in minimal invasive surgery, and uh, that can be used issue. So this can happen, problem can happen because of direct coupling, insulation failure, and capacitive uh, coupling. Okay. So direct coupling, this is uh, accidental activation can occur between, so you have the uh, active electrode, and then there is any metal uh, part like hooks uh, used for, or scissors used. And if they come in direct touch, then uh, this is called direct coupling. The circuit can be completed through that. And uh, if it is touching the area other than, uh, you know, what you want to cut or coagulate, uh, that can cause, so to say, a bowel can get, you know, charred and can get, and then 
everything goes fine. The patient wakes up in the recovery with uh, pain, abdomen, and leakage. That can happen. So this was actually common. Same thing again, insulation failure. If there's insulation failure, uh, there can be direct injury to the areas which are in contact with the diathermy. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And there can be capacitive coupling as well. Uh, capacitors are formed when there are two metals separated by an insulator. Quite common with, uh, you know, you have the metal conductor, you have an insulator inside. Okay. And then again, conductor. Uh, with the tip, so the wire going through, and they can uh, cause capacitive coupling, and this can induce uh, uh, within other metals. It can induce heat within the metals which are used used commonly in uh, minimally invasive cover in a surgery, and they are touching something else that can cause burn. Okay. So it's very common in uh, these uh, plastic kind of cannulas. Uh, where there is metal, then plastic cannula, and then conductor again. So that's uh, possible. And like I said, it's usually uh, the bowel uh, which comes in contact uh, with this area and uh, where they can be damaged to, to the bowel. Thank you. So recommendations are that you should inspect the insulation, uh, use lowest power possible for cutting a coagulation, um, use the lowest voltage uh, waveform uh, when you're using cutting. And uses a brief intermittent activation uh, instead of using it for long, uh, you know, cutting procedures. And do not have open circuits in a sense that you know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the plates, the the foot plates, uh, can sometimes be accidentally pressed, even though you're not using it. Uh, they it can be pressed by other people. So make sure that there are no open circuits uh, available. And uh, do not activate in close proximity or direct contact with another instrument. Like there should be no direct contact uh, with a, another metal instrument when using a diathermy. Keep it away from the diathermy itself. Okay, those are recommendations. The other, other common thing is with diathermy is the smoke. Uh, so when you're cutting, you are going to produce uh, chemical smokes. And these are risk for acute and chronic health. Uh, and this was... this. Uh, was very evident during the COVID time. Uh, suddenly, uh, smoke evacuators became available in all theaters. Everybody was using it. Uh, previously, they were used only ENT for like uh, papilloma surgeries, uh, but then they started using for everything. Okay. Dathomy and fires. This I had discussed uh, uh, about a case uh, on the group and alcohol oxygen and paper drapes or cloth drapes or inco pads, they don't go together. So if the surgeon is using uh, alcoholic prep and uh, they have got anything, paper drapes and things which get soaked, they can catch fire very easily and cause burns. So be careful that when they have alcohol preparation, uh, do not apply, let it dry completely. So no drape should be applied to the patient till everything is actually dry. And that's how it actually also gives you uh, better uh, antisepsis as well. So I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm going to stop sharing as well because we will do the lecture in a few more minutes. And till then I will actually share something here. Let's go and first stop this. I don't know how to do that. Stop sharing in a minute. Sorry, guys. <laughs>